Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Lewis, Director of Gastrointestinal Oncology, Intermountain Healthcare in Utah. Joining me today is Dr. Don Dizon, Head of Community Outreach and Engagement at the Legareta Cancer Center and Director of Medical Oncology at Rhode Island Hospital. We are speaking at the 2024 ASCO Annual Meeting in Chicago, and would like to address an important question many doctors are familiar with. What keeps you up at night? So Don, I know you and I are both addicted to social media. We're not <laughs> talking about our smartphones right. and the light they emit for, you know, right in front of our faces as we're trying to have our head hit the pillow. But on a deeper, more philosophical level, I think our field carries a lot of emotional weight. So mm -hmm. open ended question, but what is it off the top of your head that keeps you up at night? Um, it's poignant. Um, and I think it's, it's a, a very common scenario that I've run into recently mm -hmm. that illustrates, I think, what we as oncologists have to grapple with. And oftentimes it's the question that we all have is, is it better to do nothing mm -hmm. or do we need to do something? Yes. You know, and it can play out with the, you know, the 92 year old grandmother presenting with a treatable cancer who's just incredibly sick. And the question is, do you go by where the literature is telling you, which is someone who may be nearing the end of her life through natural causes? Yeah. Um, do you just let her go? Or do you intervene with something that's treatable, yes. but not likely to to kill her either. Right. You know? Yeah. Or it could be like the, you know, the young mom, mm -hmm. you know, who is just as terminal at diagnosis. So, and you know in your heart nothing you do is going to help her. But to admit that to a family yes. and even to her is, is oftentimes very painful. Yes. Absolutely. And I don't think we as oncologists give ourselves a space to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And so we make emotive decisions. Yes. Sort of, you know, the adage of, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Yep. So you might as well try to do something. And I am oftentimes just reminded of where, you know, the literature is about treatment being a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. You know. I don't know about you. I had formal ethics education mm -hmm. in medical school. And one of the exercises they put us through was the trolley problem, mm -hmm. which, again, goes far beyond medicine. But you're standing by the track with a lever in our hand. And to go back to your point, if we do nothing, we know that the disease is going to kill our patient. But if we intervene, it's almost like we are you know, violating the first rule of medical ethics, which is first do no harm. Mm -hmm. um, and when we pull that lever of chemotherapy, you and I both know all too well that we can inflict toxicity. And on some level, that just feels wrong yeah. as a physician. And certainly as an oncologist, we come up against that all the time. I'll tell you what keeps me up. I hate to overpromise and under deliver. Yeah. And there's a couple different levels. I mean, first of all, you and I are here at ASCO. So I'm going to leave this meeting, I think, filled with you know, novel findings I can tell my patients about. But my first concern is, can I actually execute? Can I actually give them these new treatments we're hearing yeah. about? I mean, we still have problems with drug shortages of sort of backbone agents, I'm sure, in your field especially, you know, to not have access to something like cisplat. It's just mind boggling. Yeah. So can I really, in good conscience, tell them, hey, there's this new treatment and I can give it to you. So I think that's one area. Mm -hmm. There's also, I think, the haziness of informed consent. Um, you know, as part of respecting autonomy, we're supposed to sit down and tell people and sort of risk benefit. Um, I don't know about you though, when I start thinking about the list of everything that can go wrong, it's like uh, you know commercials for drugs where there's that kind of breathless audio underneath and yeah. it tells you all the adverse events. And, so I, I often feel like I'm scaring someone off if I just read that entire litany. On the other hand, am I being you know, intellectually dishonest if I don't tell them uh, all the potential risks? So those are kind of my initial thoughts about what, what keeps me up. No, and I think that's, you know, it's such a relevant thing just to take the, the issue of consent. You know, and you're right, everything we do, we have nothing in our armamentarium that is not associated with risk. And right. some of these are very significant risks. Yes. And I think, you know, we as oncologists want to guide our patients towards a treatment that we think is going to, you know, balance the risks and the benefits in a way that there are more benefits if you just trust me. Right. But I think the thing that always brings it home is when, 
you overemphasize the benefits and you say, sure, there are risks, both yes. they're manageable. And then someone comes in with something that's extremely serious. Right. Then, yeah, you, you have to, or at least I, I do wonder um, whether I did something right. Yes. In that point. And I think that whole language of, you know, did you do it? Did you do this right? Or did you do this wrong? It would be great if our field was, had so much certainty. Yeah. But we have to acknowledge in so many things that we are living in and treating in a very uncertain way. And this balance of what you know and what you don't, I think, at least for me, I have a level where I'm comfortable, but then there's a level where I'm absolutely not comfortable. Yes. And I think that that, that makes it very difficult. Yeah, well said. I also think, I'm sure you think about this too, that the risk is both short and long term. Yeah. There was a fantastic talk yesterday at Asco Voices by Fawn Gallagher, a rectal cancer survivor. And she really made a, a very moving testimony about, you know, with the initial rush of diagnosis and when her doctors were presenting the treatment plan, you know, like you just said, everything was, if you don't do this, you're going to die of your cancer. So, of yeah. course, you're going to accept even, you know, extremely high risk as presented to you. But she said now that the dust has settled and that she's in survivorship, she's realizing all of these irreversible toxicities from her treatment that, frankly, she didn't even fully grasp in the moment. Yeah. You know, you and I both give platinum agents. As a GI oncologist, the drug that actually weighs on me the most is oxaliplatin. Yeah. Especially using it in the adjuvant setting. Um, I think that's a whole other realm of balancing risk and benefit. You know, giving chemotherapy to people who we don't actually know have active cancer is such... It's such a hard sell, or it should be. When I first heard about it in fellowship, I was yeah. like, wait, what? I'm going to give people chemotherapy without proof that they actually need it. I think that's something I still wrestle with now. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the benefits of our treatments, especially when you just tell someone, that, hey, you know, the treatment, your, your surgery was curative and yeah. you don't have any cancer. Yes. But we're still going to give you some chemotherapy. There right. might be those microscopic yes. cells or walking around, you know, in your body, and we want to target them. And it's always, you know, it's like, does it though? Right. I mean, how does bathing a, a traveling cell in chemo kill it? Does it really do that? You know? So there are these things that defy logic almost and so much is what we do. And again, it's, a, it's about that sort of living in this uncertainty. And, you know, I was just recalling at um, an LGBTQ event, there was this person that um, presented their story Gen, uh, transgender uh -huh. diagnosed with breast cancer while on gender affirming hormone therapy breaks the treatment goes through the surgery goes through chemo and then just asks a simple question can when can i restart my therapy and it's such an uncomfortable question for oncologists yes. because from our perspective for better or for worse hormones are bad when it comes to cancer taking hormones is bad even though the data to back that up doesn't exist mm. so it's almost this guttural sense but you know instead of saying i think it might your, your cancer might recur if you take this i don't know why i think that you know acknowledging to oneself yes that i don't know the answer oftentimes what people are saying is like you know I don't know, and I think if you do it, it's a bad thing, and I don't know why I feel that way, and that's it. And that, I think, is, you know, the play that yes. we're talking about. Yes. Sort of like you want someone to live after cancer, but you want them to live well. You know, it's not that hard to, to, to like, practice in the great... It's what we do all the time, but it is an issue when you do get these visceral senses of what I think you should do. Uh-huh. And all you're seeing it through is from the lens of an oncologist. Yes. Rather than seeing you're talking about this entire person's identity. Yeah. And you're not giving that any, any weight at all. Right. You know, and I think that's, you know, having done that in the past myself, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to do something wrong. Yeah. And yeah. Exactly right. Well, you even started off with your examples. I noticed that you weren't focused necessarily on the tumor type. You were focused yeah. on the person, their age, and their demography. And, you know, to me, this all fits into the larger dialogue about shared decision making. Yeah. I think paternalism was predicated on the notion that you and I walk in in a white coat and sort of project omniscience. And 
with that sort of confidence, the patient would just agree to whatever we said. And to me, with SDM, it's more about being honest about the things that you and I don't know. I, I sometimes feel a little bit like a weather forecaster. <laughs> and when I was growing up in Britain, there was a meteorologist who was sort of famously uh, pilloried in the press for getting the forecast wrong. And when he was defending himself, you know, his ultimate sort of statement was, well, what, what do you want me to say? You know, it's going to be warm and, and dry, but, you know, with cooler and rainier spells. He's like, that's the only way I can tell you the forecast, honestly. So I think somewhere between uh, paternalism mm -hmm. and what I call a la carte oncology, where you and I just give the menu to the patient with zero guidance, we got to meet somewhere in the middle. And I think some yeah. of that comes with admitting our uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think it also comes with admitting that we're human beings. Yeah. And as such, you and I actually are shaped by our experiences. You know, these days our patients can come in and they can be extremely well read on clinical studies, but what they don't have respectfully is they don't have this gestalt that you and I form the hard way through years and years of training and practice. So sort of like you were saying, get this guttural sense of how things are gonna go. And it's tough because, you know, through confidentiality, we can't tell them all of the cases that yeah. we've seen. We can just sort of, for them, share our sense, like you were saying, it's yeah. very, very difficult to put that into words sometimes. Yeah, well, you know, I think that sort of brings up this uh, notion that I've been aware of, mm -hmm. that it is a sort of longitudinal experience of practice, but it always comes down to, I remember that one patient. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> and that is literally the guidance. And on the other side, it's what we, I think me, I don't appreciate it when a patient says, I won't do this because my sister, my mm -hmm. friend did that and this happened to her. Yes. And we're like, oh, that's just so not irrational. a way to make decisions. Yes, exactly. exactly. That's just not. But then when we are dealing with uncertainty, it's always like, well, I do remember that one person and it didn't go well. So I really don't think you should do that. Right. Right. You know? And it's funny, we, we talk so much about exceptional responders. Yeah. But I think you and I hold in our hearts, you know, the people where it just went exceptionally badly. Um, you know, Rene Lariche uh, said that every surgeon uh, carries in their heart a small cemetery where they go from time to time to pray. And I think with our surgical colleagues, you know, morbidity or mortality is literally one of their formal conferences. Mm -hmm. What I find in oncology is that we tend not to process that so much through sort yeah. of rigorous peer review. We just kind of hold it inside ourselves. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I, I've had moments of, of profound doubt where, like you're saying, it's, it's irrational. And I'm reminded, I've been teaching my son about statistics. Yeah. And I was like, hey, if I flip a coin nine times and it lands heads, you know, nine times in a row, what are the odds it's gonna land heads with that 10th flip? And he's smart enough and he was like, well, it's still 50-50, dad. But, <laughs> you know, if you've had four, I'll say, you know, poor outcomes in a row, you really do start to wonder, you know, about your own acumen and start to question your own judgment. You get into some very dangerous territory yeah. and you can undercut yourself. Um, yeah. And again, it's just, that's just why you and I are talking is yeah. I don't think we admit that enough. No, no. And I think there's no forum for us to do that. Right. It is, you know, if you had that one patient who, you know, died of adjuvant therapy, yes. you know, and, you know, it's, it's easy enough to say, I'll deal with this later because I have five other people yep. to treat yep. or I won't return that phone call from the family yes. because I have these other things to do. But they, they do start to weigh on you. They do. You know, and yeah, it's like once you experience those outcomes that were hugely unexpected, Yes. Um, that doubt is probably one of the biggest reasons that we burn out. It's so uncanny to me that you bring that up as an example, the adjuvant therapy example. When I was in fellowship, I think my first sort of, not to put it too bluntly, but sort of scarring experience, I had a 40-year-old woman with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. and the surgeon had told her, we got it all, uh, famous last words, and I was counseling her on adjuvant chemotherapy. And I was using a you know, statistical program, mm -hmm. and there was about a 1% absolute benefit in terms of her survival to doing adjuvant chemotherapy. She did it, mm -hmm. you can probably see where this is going. Yeah. She died cycle one of neutropenic sepsis yeah. in spite of growth factor support. And I remember thinking as a fellow, what have I done? Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and I obviously still carry that mm -hmm. with me, um, but you're right. I, w one thing I found helpful for processing grief, and we all do it differently, mm -hmm. I, I really do try to go to my patients' funerals, um, largely because my father's oncologist came to his. Oh. And for me, it's a form of closure that lets me say to both myself and the surviving family, you know what, I, I really did try my best mm -hmm. 
course, I'm devastated as you are about how it turned out, but that's one way I've gotten past it. Everybody I know handles it. Yeah, if, if that is interesting. It's, it's, you know, in this topic, um, you know, it always comes down to how do you handle grief? Yeah. How do you handle when, when the people you're tre- you've treated die? Yeah. Um, and I, I think I've learned to create a barrier mm-hmm. at that point and not cross it. And so that barrier is the funeral. Interesting. Yeah. yeah so I actually don't go to the funeral. I've heard, I've heard exactly that from my colleagues, yeah. I find it devastating emotionally. And it's not because I failed. Right. Um, but the funerals I went to before I decided I couldn't do this anymore, they just broke my heart. Yeah. You know, it was just, it was the magnitude of the loss. Yeah. And just experiencing that magnitude. Mm-hmm. And often it was a magnitude you would never be aware of as an oncologist. Mm-hmm. You were, you were never in the community mm-hmm. that embraced this yes. person. Yes, that's You'd important. never know what kind of love surrounded them. Uh-huh. And you never knew about the extended families. You may have seen the children, but you may not have seen the siblings. Right. And just the magnitude yeah. was just overwhelming. Well, I know we need to close. I'll just say you're right. At those um, services, you know, my inner critic sometimes is very loud in my head. And it says something like, Mark, if you'd done your job right, none of these people would be here right now. Yeah. And I'm learning in time to silence that voice. But that's, again, one of the things that keeps me up at night. Yeah. So, Don, thank you so much for your candor. As you know, you and I have been friends for a long time. I really admire your humanism. We're here at a conference that focuses a lot on science. But I sort of feel like if we don't address these issues, then you're right. This is a huge scourge in our profession in regards to burnout and even let's be honest physician suicide and you know we suffer in silence so i'm glad that we were able to talk today well it's always a pleasure to talk to you yes. i always learn uh, as much from you as i take away from our conversations uh-huh. in general well right back at you my friends <laughs> thank you thank you so much and thank you for joining us this is mark lewis speaking from the 2024 asco annual meeting in chicago for Medscape. thank you 